Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you, Louise, for that great tee up. Um, I think Louise pretty covered this in depth. In essence, the burden of chronic kidney disease is, um, is felt very heavily uh, in the Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa. Um, very prevalent, um, as she said, resource limited to solve it. And in essence, you know, end stage renal disease is um, a very dire diagnosis. It's pretty much a death sentence because of the lack of infrastructure to care for it and the lack of available treatments for it. So that is really what um, is, uh, you know, I'm sp speaking a lot about kidney disease today, but this H3 Africa, this, let's see, did it come? Here we go. The H3 Africa Human Heredity and Health in Africa project is very large uh, is in its scope, and it is not just specifically about kidney disease. So first, I just want to make sure that everyone understands the goals behind H3 Africa were, were specifically regarding genomic sciences and trying to make sure that researchers in Africa um, were, were up to speed and up to date with all of the great advancements that are happening in the rest of the world in regards to genomic science, which involved collaborations and training um, as well as access to data from Africa and especially a lot of infrastructure help. So the H3 Africa project has a lot of help, uh, especially here in the US from the NIH, but you can read a lot more about it here on their website, which I wanted to link. So they, uh, Louise mentioned, I think they've got you know, 51 different projects. Some of the projects are under the umbrella of collaborative research centers, which is where the project I'm involved in, that's the umbrella it goes under. So I'm part of the H3 Africa Kidney Disease Research Network. Um, so you can kind of see based on the titles of and descriptions of these other projects that there's lots of things besides kidney disease being studied here. But kidney disease does have a really important genomic uh, and genetic, um, uh, count, uh, not counterpart, sorry. Uh, I'm, losing the, I'm losing control of the English language right now, a component. Uh, genetic components. So it's a really great one to have involved in the H3 Africa um, umbrella. So within that kidney substudy, um, a lot of it is talking about what we in the kidney world call a a a <laughs> oh my goodness, APOL1 or APOL1, um, because as Louise said, it's really hard to pronounce. But um, that oftentimes the APOL1 gene um, can help, you know, predict if you have two alleles that you will probably get kidney disease. So a lot of the research is regard or is circled around APOL1 and how does that correspond to other um, CKD causes and, and how does this all work together? And especially as I'll get to near the end, how can we turn this information into um, treatments or prevention? So within the um, kidney disease, Substudy. This uh, is a little map showing the sites um, that are involved. Most of the work that my team does, because even within this research network, there are substudies within. Um, we work mostly with the teams in Ghana and Nigeria right now. The project that we work with has a couple aims. In addition to just learning about APOL1 um, in HIV negative African population. There's also interest in, from genetics, there's also interest in some transcriptomics and pathology data, uh, uh, data. And so we're also trying to do, collect a lot of clinical data, trying to correlate the clinical data to the genetic data and the transcriptomic data and the pathology data, as well as collecting all these samples alone is actually a huge undertaking that I'll get to in a second, um, just regarding the the logistical considerations. But we'll, well, I'll actually, oh, that's my next slide. So from a logistical standpoint, there was a lot that was needed to get this going off the ground. So first of all, the uh, NIH, one of the things that happened with the NIH funding was providing a lot of equipment to these sites. Uh, many were rural sites uh, that didn't have, you know, when we picture what uh, the lab needed to do different genetic analysis, um, it's probably very pristine with lots of bright lights. Well, here they're storing negative AD freezers outside in the lean-to in some of our sites. So there is um, just a little bit of a different vibe with um, how the equipment works and how the process works. 
With regards to the patients themselves, follow-up is very difficult. A lot of these participants don't even have cell phones and to try to get them to come to these sites for follow-up visits is really difficult. Just as difficult as what Louise was mentioning regarding um, getting them to, to a dialysis appointment. It's, it's, not, it's not possible. Um, and also we found that shipping samples. So one of the things that we're doing at the University of Michigan is the transcriptomic and genetic analysis and the pathology analysis. But that all requires the, that, that we get the tissue and urine samples shipped to us, which is no small feat um, from a small, uh, from a remote place with no access to dry ice, for instance, something that again, we probably take for granted here. So there was a lot of work done even to determine different ways in which we could get the tissues shipped in an ambient temperature and have them still uh, maintain you know, integrity so that we can do our analyses across the, across the ocean. So in general, this is how it works, that the University of Michigan put together different uh, like biopsy kits that include um, the fixatives needed for the pathology data, as well as you know, RNA later so that we could put some um, tissue there for gene expression analysis. The samples, so we shipped kits to Africa. Africa ships the biopsy kits back to the, U, to the US, to the U of M. And then one of the things that uh, um, happens is one of the things that goes back is data, right? And so that's kind of represented by this blue arrow that says reports to nephrologists data um, about the, gene the genetic, uh, you know, the APOL1 info the transcriptomic analysis info and the pathology reports. Now I did um, ask one of our pathologists uh, about, you know, how does that part work? And when you ask a pathologist for input, they always give you slides with pathology. So the next two slides are just some pathology images. So you can see the quality that we're getting back from these samples that have been shipped overseas. So that concludes the pathology piece of my presentation. Um, and now we'll move on to Transmart. Right, so I talked a little bit about what that study is trying to do in general, but some of the things that we were finding is the sites still, they were collecting all this data very diligently, but they were having trouble even having access to see their own data, let alone data being collected at other sites. Even simple things like um, within this study, not all of the participants get biopsied, but they all get followed, um, you know, longitudinal follow-up information. So even the, the idea of querying to see how many patients got a biopsy? That wasn't possible before um, with the way that they had their data organized. So um, we recognized, uh, let alone you know, information about, hey, what did the data come back from transcriptomics, from pathology? So um, we recognized that there was a role for Transmart to help fill that gap for this team. So currently there is, oh, I gotta click again, uh, a dedicated instance of Transmart that we've set up for the consortium members of H3Africa's Kidney Disease Research Network. We trained 45 investigators so far and gave them access to this instance. Um, we've created different um, quick start guides to take them through some of the most common analyses that we expect they'll do in the advanced workflow section of the Transmart interface. Right now, the data set that we have in there is over 3,000 patients, which if you're in an, used to the EHR world, that might not sound like a lot, but for a small research study from Africa, that's incredible. Um, and kidney disease in general, uh, kind of, you know, Louise talked a little bit about how the um, biopsy is a very invasive procedure. And because in many cases, there's not a lot of different therapies available for kidney disease, it's not always clinically indicated because it might not give you any information that you can act on. So biopsies in general are kind of rare in kidney disease, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So the fact that we have, um, that we're following this many patients is great and that we have already that much data aggregated is, um, is great. Not all of these have been biopsied. You can actually see that that's, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but one of the top numbers there, number of biopsy cores and kidney biopsy performed, those are some of those data points I was talking about that people want to look at. So um, we are actively curating more data, the way they've kind of organized, they have our, their cohort study, they have a case control study and a lot of longitudinal data. So we're actively working with them to try and best figure out how to put more data into this instance. So I uh, wanted to talk a bit about these, this, all the things, the bullets I'm about to show are available on the website below. I kind of copied and pasted here because I just wanted to let you see how, um, how this translates, but then I'll end with a story of specifically what's happening with the transcriptomics data and how we're going from bench to bed bedside. But right now they've got they, over 10,000 subjects recruited to participate 
Obviously, we don't have all that data in Transmart yet. That's what we're working on. They have been looking a lot at a APOL1, and they found that people carrying two risk alleles have a higher percentage of getting chronic kidney disease compared to subjects with one or none. Um, they've also found that a quarter of the healthy population right now does carry those two alleles, and a third of the ones with CKD also carry. So those are certainly that quarter of the population is, you know, that they should know um, that they're carrying those two risk alleles. So um, we are definitely recognizing that APOL1 does play a role in CKD, but we think there's other crucial factors that we're trying to in, find out about as well. Uh, but now I want to end with a little story about um, where the age three data has come into play. So what you're seeing along the left here, this, uh, these are some slides I grabbed just at the last minute while Louise was talking, because I thought it would be a really great way after I heard Zach um, to talking about, you know, how to, that these data scientists that we are involved in changing the practice of medicine. And then to hear, uh, you know, the way Louise was laid out for us, the need for kind of non-invasive, more, I think the word was low tech, low infrastructure. Um, so how are we doing that within the lab, um, the my, um, Kidney Translational Medicine Center that I work for? So a lot of what we do starts with transcriptomics data, where we then do a lot of unsupervised clustering of that data and comparing those clusters to different outcomes and subsetting oftentimes based on the transcriptomic. So clustering based on transcriptomic data. That's not new, especially if you are involved in cancer, that's not new, right? But then we're trying to use those clusters to then um, explore pathways and see if we can find other biomarkers from those pathway analyses that maybe can come from urine as opposed to a kidney tissue biopsy. And then we're trying to look to see if we can find those biomarkers in the different populations and use that as a non-invasive, low-tech, low-infrastructure way of identifying um, different diseases with urine instead of tissue. So um, now what you're seeing here is we have three different cohorts that we put together, one from the US, that's the Neptune cohort, ERCB is from Europe, and now H3 Africa from Africa. And we put those together to see that uh, indeed these clusters hold up like um, based on transcriptomic data. And the, um, the SAN key plot in the middle there is showing, so those acronyms FSGS and MCD, those are two types of kind of disease diagnoses that you can get for kidney disease, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis or minimal change disease are what those stand for. And what we're finding is that, no, um, it's not these always just the pathology data that can um, group our participants, that really the transcriptomics data groups it into different clusters. And the scatter plots you're seeing on the right there are just showing the correlation between these three data sets from the three different continents. But what we found then is that uh, and right now, this is actually work that's in review with a, with a journal. So the, um, one of the things that we found from our data is we're calling it our, the TNF activation score. So we found this TNF activity in our gene expression data. And you can see that's the cluster that's um, in red. And it shows up in all three different um, cohorts. And the TNF data, we are can help define these different clusters. And so we're, we're actively trying to research if we can see that signal of the TNF activation score in urine. Because if so, then you know we're, we've got our goal then of a low tech, low infrastructure uh, marker identification. So, so this is really exciting work that is still ongoing, obviously, and will be for a long time. But the H3 Africa data is, um, is an important piece to this puzzle. And we're excited to then be able to load this type of data into their Transmart instance as well. Um, and TNF activity can become a category, ver categorical variable that folks can, can do their analyses based on. Let me subset to folks that are in cluster one or in TNF activity score of you know, over something number. So um, this will be really exciting data for the H3 team to have access to. Uh, so I think that's it. I'm, yep, I'm definitely running out of time. I just wanted to throw out a quick acknowledgement slide to show I kind of have three levels of acknowledgements here. The top are the three PIs from the H3 Africa network and they are incredible and doing really great work on the ground. That middle section is the, the leadership at the University of Michigan that's been leading all of the efforts that I talked about, whether it's genetics or transcriptomics, 
pathology or Krista doing all of the training. I didn't really mention that, but there's a lot of work that we've done to train the coordinators in Africa and they, their trainees have come here to work under um, PIs in, in the US as well. And then that bottom row is the people within my team who are actually managing all of that data, that's Rachel, and loading it into the Transmart software for everyone. So I wanna appreciate and acknowledge all of these important people. I just get to tell the great stories. And with that, I will um, end and see if there's any questions. Sorry, I haven't been looking at the chat yet. No. So Becky, <coughs> it's Gil Oman here. What a okay. tremendous project. It's a pleasure to hear such detail. I, I was uh, impressed by your focus on APO-L1, which is recognized as an important risk factor in this country too. The um, prevalence in the population seems to be so high that maybe a single dose of this abnormal gene may be protective for some, against some other diseases. Is there any evidence for that? You know, I am not sure, Gil, but I can absolutely follow up. That, um, yeah. yeah, I will ask Dr. Sampson, who I didn't list there, is one of our uh, star researchers with an APOL1. APOL Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from folks? We're just about at time. 